Hello, everyone. Um, welcome, bienvenidos to today's core coffee chat about practical tools to save lives from overdoses. I'm Nicole Lezen. I'm one of the local consultants who facilitates a countywide initiative called the Collective of Results and Evidence Based or Core Investments, along with Nicole Young. We're your host today, and we're joined by Allie Hayes and Jen Hastings, Dr. Jen, from the Health Improvement Partnership and SafeRx Santa Cruz County Coalition. And as you can hear, today's session is held in English with Spanish interpretation. Gisela Carrasco is providing consecutive interpretation right now, and she'll also translate the written comments and questions in the chat. Soon, we'll switch to simultaneous interpretation that is provided today by Jorge Valenzuela. I'll turn it over to Nicole Young, who will give you a brief overview of CORE. Thanks, Nicole. So again, CORE stands for the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments, and it started as a funding model uh, that the county and city of Santa Cruz adopted um, to award grants and funding to uh, organizations providing health and human services and education services in our county. And in the last few years, it's evolved into both the funding model and a movement to achieve equitable health and well-being in our county using what we call a results-based collective impact approach that's responsive to community needs. And the evolution of CORE has been fueled by a lot of input and insights from a lot of different people in nonprofits, local government, philanthropy, different community groups. And so that collaborative process has led us to this core mission and vision that you see on the screen with equity at the center. And so when we say equitable health and well being, we mean that all people across the lifespan have equitable opportunities to experience these eight interdependent core conditions for health and well being. And we want to be able to reach a point where people's opportunities and their life outcomes aren't predictable for better or for worse by things like race, ethnicity, income, gender, uh, sexual orientation, immigration status, all those different um, variables. And so we talk a lot about how these core conditions are very connected, that what happens in one dimension of well being impacts and is influenced by what happens in other dimensions or areas of well being. And so when we think about core as both a funding model and a movement, it really provides us a framework and some common language to align priorities and programs and practices to really uh, work towards and achieve uh, some community level goals and that kind of collective impact that core uh, investments is really centered around. Next slide. And so today's event and core copy chats like this are offered as part of what we call the Core Institute for Innovation and Impact or Core Institute. And so we think of the Core Institute as the learning arm of core investments. So it's our opportunity to offer and host an array of trainings informational sessions, technical assistance, and really just gather people from different sectors and organizations to learn about topics and skills together so that, again, we're collectively working towards that vision for core investments. And so at this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our speakers, and we're going to start uh, with Dr. Jen, who's going to tell us a little bit more about what they're here to present to us. Thank you so much to the two Nicoles. Great to be here. And thank you so much for inviting us. So Ali Hayes and myself will be sharing this slide deck back and forth with you. And hopefully we have left enough time for you to um, yeah, ask your questions. So I encourage you to put in the chat questions that arise during the presentation so that if and I think I can see the chat so we can make it more interactive. So we'd be happy to get your question as we go along. And to our lovely Jorge, please let me know if we go too fast or if Ali and I go too fast. So we're discussing a very important topic that has unfortunately impacted many families in Santa Cruz County and in the surrounding counties of California and actually all over the United States and actually all over the world. So we are not alone in the current crisis around opioids, 
other drugs, a very, very strong opioid called fentanyl, and then a medication that actually can help us if someone is um, not breathing and because of an opioid. And so that's really what we're going to be talking about today together. Next slide. And again, thank you for inviting us. So we're going to be talking about drugs and drug use, and you'll be seeing images of drug, you know, how sort of what we call drug paraphernalia or the things associated with drugs. And we'll also be talking about poisoning related to opioids. And um, the term poisoning is, is something we'll be talking about, but that also involves overdose where someone takes too much or has is exposed to too much of an opioid resulting in death. And you may yourself have experienced this in your family or with friends. And so this can be emotionally very challenging and, and uh, stimulating or make you feel like you can't breathe or that you feel anxious. So please take care of yourself. And we understand that. So throughout this session, please take a breath, move away if it's too much for you. We are recording this so that if at a later point you feel more ready to hear the information, it's available for you. Next slide. So we also want to acknowledge, um, we want to both honor and recognize uh, the people who have died or whose lives have been affected in a way often that involves pain and grief. And we hold that grief ourselves, and it actually is with us every day in our work. It's what inspires us to do this work, but we also hold that grief ourselves. Thank you for that moment to recognize and honor those we have lost or whose lives have been forever changed or challenged. So what we know is that both in Santa Cruz County and in California, and as I already referenced our whole world, um, the rate of young people and specifically teenagers being exposed either because they were aware of it or because they were not aware. That number of, of overdose has more than tripled and meaning three times as many um, use have been affected as uh, two years ago. So it's a dramatic increase in the rate of uh, lives that have been permanently affected by opioids and other drugs. And I'm gonna pass it uh, to Ali. Thanks, Jen. Hi, everyone. My name is Ali Hayes. I have the privilege of working with Dr. Jen. And um, yeah, I think a big part of why we're talking to the community is we're concerned about everyone in California, but we're very centered on youth right now in our own county. And when Jen says that these rates have tripled, that is um, we've seen just exponential non-fatal overdoses and young people ending up in emergency departments. And then we've had fatal overdoses. And when we, when we take that moment to sort of pause and honor those we've lost since 2020, we have lost six teens in our own county um, under the age of 17. So we have been impacted by the loss of youth in our own county. So Jen and I think it's really important to not assume that everybody knows about opioids and knows about fentanyl. So we wanted to just ground you in a little bit of information. Um, so opioids are a medication that are used to treat pain. And in particular, fentanyl is ultra potent synthetic opioid. And, um, you know, it, it does have its place and it does have its use. It certainly has been used for a very long time for folks who've had difficult surgeries, who are in end of life care, um, but it is very potent. It is 50 times more potent than heroin. And I can't tell you at that moment when it 
spread into the streets and it's become this illicit drug. Um, but we started seeing um, signs of it in tox screens and overdoses in 2017 and really, really hit the map here in Santa Cruz County in 2019. And um, the amount of fentanyl, as you can see in this picture, there's a little sugar packet. The amount of fentanyl that could be in a sugar packet is potent enough to um, really um, harm, potentially kill hundreds of people. And um, we use that little penny with the few granules just to give you a sense of just how, how a little amount can be lethal. And so we want people to know there are opioids that are prescribed. Um, there is fentanyl that is used in hospitals. And then there is fentanyl that's being made um, in trafficking centers where it's being made and then added to street drugs to make them more potent. So a lot of people ask me like, why fentanyl? Why would folks that deal drugs want to have this lethal drug that would essentially kill their clients? It's very cheap to manufacture. It's simple to make. It's very easy to mix into other drugs. And, and when I'm talking to young people and they're like, why is this happening? I talk about capitalism. I talk about profit margins. This is about profit and adding fentanyl to um, drugs makes them um, more potent and they can, they can spread them out and, and basically make more money. Um, so a small amount can be used to sell a lot of product on the street. Um, and it comes in many forms powders, pills, liquid, and it's easily laced into other drugs. It can be smuggled and sold in small packages. It makes it much easier to distribute. So as you heard me say, we just want to say it again, fentanyl is up to 50 times more potent than heroin and 100 times more potent than morphine. And so when we're talking with young people, we can't just be talking about weed and alcohol and mushrooms and things like that anymore. We have to think about pills and powders. Um, and um, we'll be talking a bit more about like access to these things. Yeah, um, before we move on, any questions about what we've covered so far? All right, next slide. So um, a lot of folks are wanting to know, like, where are people getting these things? And I, and I just really need people to hear access has never been easier. Um, and uh, whether you're an adult or a young person, there are dealers on Snapchat and Instagram. There are friends who may have it. Um, there may be dealers that are um, known to family members or are known to youth in a neighborhood. Um, but I think it's really important, especially if you're working with young people, just to know that if they have access to Instagram or Snapchat and they have some payment method on their phone, they can access um, a fentanyl lace Percocet or a fentanyl lace Xanax or a variety of, of drugs. We see a lot of folks with Xanax in particular. Um, they could purchase it quite easily under $10 on the Internet. And some of these dealers even deliver. So, you know, we have this different challenge that we face in public health with access never, has never been easier. And um, we also have young people coming out of a pandemic who experienced a lot of trauma and are um, sometimes doing self-medicating. And kind of goes back to what Jen was saying, somebody might order a pill online and not know it has fentanyl and unknowingly be poisoned and lose their life. Other folks might be using fentanyl knowingly um, because they um, maybe are using it and have become addicted. And so they might be seeking fentanyl, but no one's looking to overdose. And so that's really important to hold. I'm gonna pass it over to Jen to do a little bit more of a knowledge share. Next slide. You're on mute, Jen, sorry, friend. And this is, yeah, just kind of adding to what I was just saying. Thanks. So, yes, it's um, currently one has to um, presume that any medication that you buy on the street, even if you think that it's 
um, as Ali was saying, Adderall or a Xanax, which young people are now um, often buying actually, not from a pharmacy, but from, from the street, does have fentanyl in it. And so it's extremely common that Xanax, Ativan, Valium, Oxycodone, Percocet, all these things that are either what we call benzodiazepines for anxiety, Adderall or Ritalin, which are stimulants for the condition of attention deficit, or pills that are sold on the street marketed as codeine or a variant of codeine, these all now have been found to have fentanyl mixed in. And so you really cannot buy on the street a pure medication. The only way to know that you are getting what you think you're getting is to buy it at a pharmacy. So at this point, drugs bought or medications bought at a pharmacy are, are guaranteed to be pure. But when you buy it on the street, is it not, that is not so. In addition, um, Fentanyl is often what the they say laced or cut or mixed into drugs that you find on the street for the purposes of um, pleasure or getting high, and that would be cocaine or methamphetamine or heroin. All of these now are known to be mixed with fentanyl. We learned recently that actually it is impossible to buy heroin, heroin that is just heroin. So it's, that's kind of, uh, you know, an extraordinary situation that all medications essentially that are bought on the street are mixed with fentanyl. Next slide. So why would someone want to use heroin or cocaine or methamphetamine? Um, for many of us, you know, it seems unattractive because of the risks of, of dying at this point are so strong. But you may remember when you were young, when experimenting and curiosity um, and, you know, were a big part of our lives. I know it was when I was a young adult and a teenager. So those still, those um, uh, emotions and that, uh, quest for experimentation is still there in our young people. Um, it may be on accident, they may be seeking a thrill. Many young people at this point, Ali referenced the depression and anxiety that our young people are feeling after the, um, after the COVID and the pandemic. Many people do what we call self-medicating, so using drugs to help feel better. And that's a very understandable reason to use to use drugs. Some young people, of course, want to fit in or feel pressured. And some people are already have a dependence on medication. So there are many different reasons. If we had more time together, we might turn this into a conversation. And if we have time um, at the end, uh, Nicole and Nicole, we might consider exploring this a little bit more together with the parents who are listening. Next slide. So it is difficult to know if someone like your child or your friend's child or a friend of yours is actually using drugs, including fentanyl. So we wanna talk a little bit about the signs of drug use, knowing that of course, someone, anyone can have these signs and not be using um, drugs such as heroin or methamphetamine or stimulants. So please never make the assumption um, but figuring out um, how to talk to someone and perhaps ask how they're doing um, might be a way to, you know, be a way to begin the conversation, but please never make the assumption. So changes in mood, loss of weight, um, increased anxiety, not sleeping well, increased anger, not taking care of yourself and not washing, for example, never showering. Those are changes in that, in all of those things can be an indication that someone is using drugs. But it again, it's not, a, you know, there are many other reasons for that. Not making it to work, not being able to go to school. Um, there are some classic marks on the skin, um, bruising and scars, more infections, 
uh, burns, those are other indications that might reflect drug use, and then not doing, not participating in the usual activities. Those are, can all be signs. I think this is you, Ali. Yeah, thanks, Jen. So we've been definitely throwing a lot of information at folks. Um, we've learned a little bit about opioids, um, kind of why they're showing up, why folks might be using them. We want to talk a little bit about um, what's happening when an overdose happens. We want to cover what's happening in the body. What is the wonderful life-saving thing uh, called Narcan? Um, naloxone is the other name that uh, folks may know it as. And then we really want to support and empower you to know how to respond to an overdose. Um, it is overwhelming to read about the opioid crisis and to know that folks are really struggling with substance use disorders and that we've lost so many young people. That is all really hard. Um, and I don't want to diminish that. And there's also really good news in that we have some amazing tools to save lives, such as Narcan. And then we also have a lot of incredible resources for folks navigating substance use disorders. So it's like really tough stuff, really hard news, and there's some really good news. So let's learn a little bit more about what's happening with an overdose and signs and symptoms, and then we'll move into how you can help save a life. So um, what's happening when fentanyl is causing an overdose or a poisoning is that um, when somebody has the opioids in their system, um, and too much opioids are in there, it causes the brain to stop signaling for the body to breathe. So an overdose is really, there's no urge or stimulus to breathe. A lot of folks think it's, oh, it's, it's just choking or, or vomit or something else is going on, but it's really, um, the brain is shutting down. It's basic messaging about telling the body to breathe isn't, isn't in play. And so what we're trying to do is get that breathing going again if somebody is overdosing. Next slide. So there's a lot going on on this slide, um, but it's really important to just have some awareness of the signs and symptoms of an overdose. Um, because we, we, before we give somebody uh, Narcan, we want to do our best to see if, you know, they've met some of the criteria. Um, what I really want to look for is if I can, when I come across somebody who's maybe slumped over or um, is lying on their back somewhere, I want to assess pretty quickly, can I stir them? Can I wake them up? Um, I can use my knuckles on their sternum right here to put some pressure to cause some discomfort, but not any bruising. I can shake them. I can speak really loudly. If they are not responding at all, the next thing I'm going to do is, is really get in there and listen for breathing. Um, am I hearing any breathing? Is there choking? Is there gurgling? Is there some struggle to breathe? And then I'm also going to be assessing for discoloration of the lips and the nail beds. These are kind of the top three that we want to look for pretty quickly. Um, if I have got two of those things going on, I'm probably going to get out my Narcan. I'm not necessarily going to check pupils, check the temperature of the skin, but we're really looking, can we stir them? Are they breathing or struggling to breathe? And um, are we seeing um, discoloration? And when we say discoloration, it could be purple nails and purple um, purplish colors in the nail beds, or if somebody with a darker complexion, it can be a more ashy gray color on the lips and on the nail beds. So these can be signs of an overdose. And we're gonna say this multiple times. The good news is if you administer Narcan, which we're gonna show you how to do soon, and somebody is not overdosing, you will cause no harm. So we're assessing these symptoms to see if we wanna administer Narcan. We're always gonna be calling 911. So just bring this up in that Every one of these symptoms doesn't have to be there for you to choose to administer Narcan. All right, next slide. So naloxone is um, the brand name of Narcan. It's a medication and an antidote that can reverse an opioid overdose. And the most common form is a nasal spray. There is some that can be injected into the... Um, the muscle in the leg, um, but the most common that you're gonna find, and you'll see a little picture right there on the slide, but I've also got some in my hands. Um, 
it's a nasal spray. And if um, Jen's got the little pink box and I've got what's inside the box and in the box is two of these kits, which is awesome. And um, what I want you to know is that if you've ever um, squirted nasal spray in your nose, or maybe you had a baby that had a congested nose, it's a simple, simple administration of one push. It's very easy. Um, young people can do this as well as older folks. And what we know is that when we administer it, usually within one to two minutes, folks are gonna start to come out of that um, overdose. The reversal um, should begin to kick in. It is true that sometimes folks need more than one dose because fentanyl is so potent. Um, but remember there are two doses in a kit. Um, but what I wanted you to just know is that it's a nasal spray, it's easy to administer and that it does have life-saving effects. It can pull somebody out of an overdose, um, but they could overdose again in 30 to 90 minutes. So a person who's had um, a fentanyl overdose and we've given them Narcan, they might need more than one dose in the future. And so we always wanna very firmly but compassionately encourage people to seek medical attention after they've been given naloxone. Before I go any further, Jen, um, would you like to add anything else, friend? Am I hitting all the notes? You're on mute. Thank you. And I may not have heard it, but one of the other key things is that if you give this medication to someone and they don't have opioids in their system, you have not done any damage. So often when we do this demonstration, which we'll do in a minute, and we squish I squish the Narcan in my own nose. There's no effect at all. So you never have to worry. You will not cause any damage or affect anyone negatively by giving Narcan. So that's a, you know, there's no risk by giving it. Yeah, and really what's happening with the Narcan is if somebody has opioids, it's pulling those opioid receptors off the brain. If somebody hasn't had opioids, it's not going to have an impact. Taking the opioids off the receptors. Yeah, I, I said that funny. You're right, Jen. That's, okay. That's all right. You did perfect. Yeah. All right. So next slide. I think I'm. we transition over to you here, Jen. So we're just kind of reinforcing the different steps. We want you to yeah. feel comfortable. So if you find those symptoms that Alan Ali talked about, like not breathing, not responsive, blue nails, dusky skin. The first thing you want to do, well, people go back and forth. Do you give right. them Narcan and then call 911 or do you call 911 and then give the Narcan? So it's all in there, all bunched up together. You'll see different recommendations. But if you're with someone else, yell out, call 911, and then you want to open your box and you want to pull out one of these. And we're going to show you in a video in a moment, but you're going to um, peel off the cover, put this up the nose, and then click. And that's it. And we're going to show you um, the video in next, and then we're going to go walk through it one more time. We want all yeah, of you to feel really a, comfortable. A quick question um, in the chat from Carol. Oh. Um, just wanted to bring that to your attention about whether a person has to actually Let's breathe see. in. No, it's absorbed through the nasal passages. That's the beauty of it. So you, they do not have to breathe. It comes, so there are many, many little tiny blood vessels up at the end of the nose, and it's very close to the brain. So it's a fantastic, easy, simple. Now, if someone is not breathing, you may want to give them rescue breaths as part of CPR. But um, the, in terms of giving the Narcan, they do not need to take a breath in in order to get the Narcan. The Narcan is absorbed rapidly into the, the, the body, into the tissues in the brain. And as we just were talking about, this medication is has a much stronger um, like desire to hang on to those opioid receptors and kicks the opioids off. And then a consequence though, is that someone may go into fairly quick, what we call withdrawal. So they no longer have the opioids on those receptors. So they're gonna 
they're going to be cranky. They're not going to feel so good, um, but they'll be alive. So, and one of the things that that is kind is to stay with that person and reassure them as they begin to not feel so good to say, you know, you're going to not feel so good right now, but you're alive and I'm going to stay with you. And as Ali said, this, this medication lasts between 30 and 60 minutes but the opioids are still in the body. And so they can go back to those receptors. And so keeping being with them, seeing if they need another dose and getting them um, into emergency room care is appropriate. So I think we can go to the next slide. Was that, so Carol, did that help? Yes, that definitely helped. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we have two videos. We're going to show the first one in English and we'll show it again in Spanish. And they're very short, but they're a great visual. If you suspect someone has overdosed, try to get their attention by firmly rubbing your knuckles up and down the center of their chest. Next, call 911 with your location and the person's symptoms. Now it's time to administer naloxone. Peel back the package to remove the device. Place the nozzle tip in their nostril until your fingers touch the bottom of the nose. Press the plunger firmly to release the dose. Place the person on their back and tilt up the chin to clear the airway and support breathing. Give a second dose if the first one does not work within one to three minutes. Care for the person by rolling them on their side. Stay until medical help arrives. Sobredosis pueden producirse en un instante, pero se puede salvar una vida administrando el atomizador nasal de Naloxon como un arcán en unos simples pasos. Primero, compruebe. Observe si la persona no responde o muestra otros signos de sobredosis sacudiéndola, llamándola por su nombre o frotándole el pecho con firmeza. Llame al 911 de inmediato. Segundo, atomice. Incline la cabeza de la persona hacia atrás, inserte la boquilla en cualquiera de las fosas nasales y presione con firmeza la parte inferior del atomizador. Tercero, respire, ponga a la persona sobre su espalda, apriete su nariz y realice dos respiraciones catelentas en sus pulmones cada cinco segundos, asegurándose de que el pecho se eleva. Si no responde en dos o cinco minutos, administre otra dosis. Cuarto, Recuperación. Si la persona comienza a respirar por sí misma, póngala de lado en posición de recuperación. Para obtener más información y obtener la zona gratuita, visite ohgainsod.ohio.gov. Ok. Great. So I think you saw there, um, it did say in the Spanish version, I can't remember for the English, but if the person doesn't respond within... They say two to three minutes, but I'll tell you, when someone's not breathing, typically within a minute, if they're not responding, then you'll give the second dose. So this is a review, this slide. So we first, you have your packet, I don't know if you can see me, you peel off the back, you place this smooth protruding thing up into the nose until you can't go any further, until your fingers touch the outside of the, or the end of the nose and then you press. In the little video, it showed the, the um, plunger coming back at you. It, once you've pressed, you cannot press again. In my use thing, you see it disappears, the little plunger. So that's a review of how to do it. And we're happy to take questions about this now. If um, people want to, un I saw that people can unmute. Yes, Ali. Um, I wanted to just acknowledge that when this happens, adrenaline can be high. And so some of the things that I've kind of taught myself is call 911 and remember the three P's. Mm. Anyway, we could go back a slide. That's possible. Yeah. So that's the peel. No, back the other way. There, there we, we go. go. So 911 and the three P's. And that's if I'm alone. Um, I'll, I'll call 911 and then administer. And so I'm peeling. I'm placing it, I'm getting it in the nose, and then I'm pressing. Um, the reason why we recommend that you call 911 first when you're alone is that fentanyl has really changed the game. Folks, um, when they overdose, it's quick, and uh, they stop breathing pretty quickly. It can be very uh, 
time is of the essence. And so um, I do think we will see the CDC change some of their language in the next year. I've seen some of the back and forth going on. Um, if somebody is calling 911 and they're very stressed out and they can't remember the address, time is ticking. And so it's strongly recommended if you're alone to administer the Narcan, um, then call 911. Um, but as long as you do both and get it done, that's the most like important thing. And then you saw in the Spanish video, I really like the visual. Um, a lot of folks do not feel comfortable doing rescue breathing. They haven't been trained. Maybe all you feel like you can do, um, especially if it's a stranger and you're worried about COVID or things like that, is administer the Narcan and call 911. But if you are curious, watching those videos again, you're going to have access to these slides. That was a really good visual in the um, Spanish version showing just what rescue breathing looks like, pinching the nose, how to do the breaths. So I really like that video. Just wanted to add that. Thanks, Jen. Yeah, and I think in the CPR, it's moved to just the rescue breaths and not the compressing the chest. It's just the breathing and then going back. So every five seconds doing a deep breath. Yeah, thanks for adding that. And of course, the three Ps don't work so well in Spanish, but Correct. So rest er y yeah. That's a good point. Thank yeah. you. Dr. Yeah. Jen and Ali, I'm noticing that Benjamin has a, a hand raised. Benjamin, go ahead and ask your question or comment. Yeah, I heard that um the that there's two doses in there. When you follow the directions on the screen, does that insert both of them at the same time? Or how do oh, you Oh, it's two, it's so it is two packages. I've got one here that I haven't opened yet in second. You get two in each box. Got yeah. it. Right. I mean, there are going to be more brands now coming that now that Narcan is available over the counter and each of these. So it may be packaged differently. But right now, as as Ali noted, it's the the box with the black and pink writing with a pink stripe. And there are two. And I'm glad there are two because pretty much with fentanyl, you'll need at least two. And that's the other reason why it's good to call 911, because if you only have one box, it is possible that you will need, you know, four doses of Narcan, for example, to, to be able to wake someone up. Um, Dr. Jen, do you see that there's another question from Tara about um, whether the videos would suffice as- That's considered sufficient, mm -hmm. but um, if, because you're at the volunteer, you can ask for a training like this, um, SafeRx does not have huge capacity at this point, but um, we're hoping that we get some more funding for us to be able to do more trainings, just to have the opportunity for people to ask questions. But this is considered training, watching the videos, yes. And Tara, you're welcome to share the recording of this presentation as well. Yeah, and I saw that there are several wonderful community partners. The Department of Healthcare Services does have a naloxone clearinghouse. Um, nonprofits that are serving vulnerable populations are often eligible to order their own Narcan and be able to give it to youth and parents and community members. Um, if you're interested in that, I dropped my email in the chat. Max is going to drop um, their email and my email together. And if folks want to connect after this training to find out if your organization might want to order their own Narcan and hand it out, we can help set that up. For example, we just helped the Diversity Center fill out the application and um, order their supplies and then give them, and we help them with their training materials so that their staff and volunteers, um, they hope to start handing out Narcan for free um, to the LGBTQ community by the middle of November. That's so exciting. That's so great. Yeah. And you, by each of you being here and you're now trained essentially, um, so, you know, you can, it can be a wave of training the trainer. Yeah. Love that. Great. Thanks for the questions. Keep them coming. Yeah. We love questions. Makes it much more fun for us. <laughs> I think we can go to the next slide, which is about where to get Narcan. And I, um, I lost track, Allie, of how far I go. I think I do a few more here. Yeah. So, this one's um, you, friend. Yeah. Okay. So, um, 
we have created several resources for you to, so you know where to get them. And that's the last bullet there, community resources. We also are helping support um, pop-up events where people can um, basically drive through. We did that um, one at Cabrillo. There was one up in the Felton. We're hoping to organize a few more of those in the near future. But you can also get Narcan from your medical provider. Um, we're having to educate medical providers in Santa Cruz because even just a few weeks ago, people were saying medical providers thought that a person had to have a diagnosis of an opioid use disorder in order for the provider to uh, write the prescription. That is not true. Any person can get a prescription for Narcan. And Narcan is recently over the counter. And so I'm not sure that it's already arrived in our pharmacies locally, but you theoretically can go buy um, without a prescription an over-the-counter box of Narcan. It is not inexpensive, meaning it costs about $45. That's our understanding. And so I'm hoping that the prescription of Narcan will remain available. Um, my understanding is that if you have Medi-Cal, you will always be able to get Narcan from as a prescription and you will not have a copay with Medi-Cal. So I'm very glad to, I can say that uh, definitively, um, that if you have Medi-Cal, you can ask your provider for Narcan and you will not have to pay anything for it. It will be covered without a copay. And so if you take your phone and look at the and do the QR box, you should come up to the um, resource sheet that we provided as to where you can get Narcan um, if with um, um, without paying for it. And I think let's go to the next slide unless you want to add anything. And in terms of the Narcan directory, if there's accessibility issues and somebody is homebound or it might be hard to get to one of these locations, just want to appreciate the Harm Reduction Coalition of Santa Cruz County. If you call and leave a message, they will deliver. And if you need more than one box, they will provide it. So i um, really grateful. Janice has easy walk-in hours as well. And then we have several other folks that are listed on the right. directory. Right. So that's um, with reference to the last slide in that QR code. So some of you may have heard about xylazine which um, has been in the media a little bit. It is actually a, a horse tranquilizer or a tranquilizer used in veterinary medicine. Um, up to a few weeks ago, they were saying it is not an opioid, but in fact, it has now been found to have properties of, of an opioid. So it's not so clear. And so even if someone has xylazine, um, they've ingested xylazine and it it is, people aren't, well, now, most people are not buying it on purpose to use. Some people may, but it is now being found mixed with other medications. Um, and that makes the um, risk of overdose even greater because of the sed sedating properties of xylazine, meaning it makes you very tired, it slows down your breathing rate, and so you're more likely to overdose. It is also associated with wounds that don't heal. So if someone injects something and it has xylazine in it, then the part of what xylazine does is destroys the tissues and they people get huge, horrible wounds that don't uh, heal and often lead to people losing uh, limbs like arms and legs. So it's it's kind of a dev another devastating, we didn't need anything else. Fentanyl was enough, but this is the newest um, drug that's um, been found to be mixed with other, um, in other drugs recreationally. So the next slide has a little bit more about xylazine. Um, it can be hard to identify. The symptoms of a xylazine overdose are mentioned here. So a dry mouth, feeling sleepy, uh, breathing slowly, low blood pressure, that's actually very similar to fent fentanyl. And so um, we encourage you to go ahead and give Narcan, even if um, you think it is just xylazine, because there may be some response 
uh, for, to the Narcan. I, if I can just add, Jen. Um, sure. Yeah, if we can back the slide up. So yeah, just, like just um, really want to highlight that we have an incredible xylazine library that many of our partners worked on on the SaferX webpage in Spanish and English with great resources, um, including a wonderful handout for providers and just some ways to frame it to educate folks. And sadly, we had our first xylazine and fentanyl overdose death um, first week in June. So xylazine is in our community. Right, but not as common as in San Francisco. Um, what's interesting is that Correct. we were hearing about xylazine for many, many months. It was probably about a year ago that we first learned about xylazine, but it took a while for it to cross the country and reach us. Yeah. Next slide. And I think this is you. Thanks, friend. Yeah, so for those of us that work with young people, um, you know, this can be a lot to process and how do we, how do we talk about this? Um, there's lots of different strategies and approaches we can take, but it's really clear we have to. We have to talk openly about substances. We have to highlight fentanyl um, because our young people are being so, you know, impacted. Uh, and we need to we need to really work on how do we talk about these things without stigmatizing substance use, um, shutting the door with these conversations with young people. I want to encourage folks to enter them with compassion, with, with curiosity, with kindness, and that this is an ongoing conversation we have to have. And I think about my son's 19 now, started talking about substances with, when he hit middle school, sixth grade, checking in regularly. Are your friends doing these things or what are you seeing? And, and interestingly enough, it was like, no, 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 no. And then junior year, marijuana, alcohol, some pills and powders um, among friends and what he was seeing in school. And so if I wasn't having those ongoing conversations, I wouldn't have known that. We always wanna keep the door open for the conversation to continue. You might have a really rich two minute conversation with a teenager <laughs> and then, you know, they might not talk about it again for two weeks, but you always wanna leave that door open. And I think that there's a lot of teachable moments in talking with young people. And um, something that a lot of folks don't think about is TV has really changed. Streaming, Netflix, Hulu, HBO, these are all paid channels. That's very different than CBS or ABC or NBC, which a lot of teens don't watch anymore. And so what they're seeing are high school dramas on Netflix or high school dramas on HBO, where, where drug use is, is rampant it's excessive, it's normalized. Um, and so if you are in a group of, uh, if you're with a group of young people and you ask them how many of you watch the show Euphoria and they're all raising their hand and you don't even know what Euphoria is, you need to watch Euphoria. That's just an example of one show that's become kind of a phenomenon among young people where drug use is really, really like normalized and common. There is a character who's struggling with substance use disorder. There's some good stuff going on in that, that show. But, but if, you, if you think young people aren't seeing drugs and alcohol um, in film and music videos and poetry and books, they are. And so we have to talk about it. Next slide. So um, we all have our our comfortability talking with young people. But an effective conversation with youth about fentanyl is really, you know, you wanna focus on listening, facts, like what do we know is true, and really trying to work from a place of being non-judgmental. So you might ask some non-judgmental questions like, is fentanyl something you've heard about in the news or in school? Do you think the risks are exaggerated or do you think they're pretty accurate? I love to ask this question to my son and his friends multiple times when they've gone to parties. You know, if a teen took a pill and accidentally overdosed at a party, what do you think you might do? Not to scare them, but like, think about it. Like, what might you do? Um, and then what have you heard about Narcan or Naloxone? So these are just examples of like how to get the conversation going. I think the best place to talk to teens is when you're driving around in a car because they're sort of trapped in the vehicle with you. Maybe they're listening to their favorite music. 
and you can bring this up in a very relaxed way. Like, hey, we need to talk about alcohol and other drugs because these things are happening in the world and I care about you and we need to talk about it. So yeah, just wanting to give everybody um, props for having these conversations if you're already having them and also just giving you the support and the, the encouragement to, to start having these conversations. And when I do community nights, a lot of people say, when should we start talking to our kids? I would say definitely before middle school. But I did a parent night one night and there were a bunch of, of families that brought their kids of all ages. And there was a five-year-old and an eight-year-old sitting in the front row and they were pretty engaged. And I said, when was the first time that you realized drugs and alcohol was like a thing? And the eight-year-old said, and he had a very distinct memory. He was like, I was four years old and this is what I know knew about drugs. So he really illustrated the value of starting young, having these conversations. Kids are paying attention. And um, we're talking a lot about illicit street drugs, but there could also be opioids from grandma's leftover knee surgery in the medicine cabinet. There could be um, opioids that were provided to somebody and they could be in the house. So we also want to have those conversations because teens might go seeking for something to make them feel better. We want to encourage you to think about getting rid of things when you don't need them anymore, locking them up, but also having those conversations if those drugs are in the house. Maybe there's somebody who has chronic health issues and needs opioids in the house. So you do need to have those conversations as well. All right. So um, good news. There are two incredible booklets that Jen and I and our Tri-County partners had the privilege of working on together. These booklets are like mini film books, if you will, and they're really designed for you to hang on to them. We have one for middle schoolers and one for high schoolers, and they're designed for parents, guardians, and caregivers. And they really guide you on how to have conversations about um, youth and mental health and substances. And then um, these booklets have been kind of curated for our region, for Monterey, San Benito, and Santa Cruz County. So there's some local resources on the back. There's a QR code in the slides that you're also going to get. And then on our web um, page for SaferX, these booklets exist. And some school districts are starting to print them. You might be at a parent night and see them, but we do have them as PDFs so that everybody has access to them. And they're, they're wonderful. If you have a young person even going off to college, I think these are really great resources. I just read the middle school one again because it's kind of hot off the presses. And I was like, this is really good. So we hope you'll check that out. Over to you, Jen, to talk Thank about you. Our Yes. So um, in addition to those, the booklets that we're very, very proud of, um, we have additional resources. On the left there, we have our Medication for Addiction Treatment, or MAT, directory. And this is where in Santa Cruz County you can go to access um, the different forms of um, medications that can help if someone has a dependency on opioids. Um, and so this is available, the directory is in English and Spanish. And I'm proud to say that in Santa Cruz County, pretty much every single health entity, so every um, clinic and PAMF and Dignity and every place that you go, does have a provider who can help you um, or your loved one get treatment, essentially. We also have um, different ways for you to access, um, essentially, what we are calling comprehensive resources, not just um, the medication for addiction treatment, but we encourage you to go, or we'd love for you to go to our website and see all the different things that are available to support you and your and the people in your life who might need that support. And then always we would appreciate if any of these resources um, aren't um, landing, let's say you click on a resource and the phone number is wrong or the website has information that's not accurate. We so appreciate if you communicate that to us. We're very dedicated to having an accurate uh, res resource for you. And so if you find that something is not up to date, please let us know. We, we do 
um, check them recently, or sorry, frequently, but sometimes we miss something. So we really appreciate the dialogue with you all. And then our last slides are about what you can do um, as a parent or as a community member. So you're doing the first thing, which is to get informed. Learn about fentanyl, learn about how to use Narcan. And one of the things that's so, um, I would say, painful to us at SafeRx is the, the, um, the negative effects of stigma or when someone judges someone else for using drugs. We, I think I can share that um, our health officer uh, recently lost her, her eldest son to a fentanyl overdose. And she was not aware that he was using um, heroin and fentanyl. And so had they been able to have that conversation, maybe things would have turned out differently. But it, drug dependence is, you know, reaches all of us. It's not just someone who's homeless or someone who has had a difficult life. People with a great amount of privilege and resources also can become dependent. So one of the things that we're very, um, really working hard on as a, as a community is to try to address this stigma that we really feel is even more damaging than the drug use itself sometimes. So as we talked earlier about asking, if you're if you see signs in someone that might suggest drug use, please talk to them um, if you're concerned and try to do that in a way that's that shows your love, your empathy, and your concern. So the other thing would be to reduce risk around your house. So if you have prescription medications that have opioids in them, make sure they're in a locked box. If you use opioids, make sure they're in a place that someone can't get into inadvertently. If you have unused medications, go ahead that we now have a process in our Santa Cruz County where you can return those drug medications to the pharmacy. Get Narcan. You've, now you know how to use it, um, but you can review the videos um, and then know your resources. So those are kind of our suggestions um, for what you can do to help address um, the current crisis that we're in. Do you want to add anything, Ali? I think we're um, right just, on time. Yeah, just real quickly. Narcan is really no good if nobody where, knows where it is or knows how to use it, which is true like a fire extinguisher, right? A lot of people have it in their home, but not everybody's been trained on where it is and how to use it. So if you're an adult with teens in your house, showing them where it is, showing them how to use it is important. Um, they may never use pills and powders, but a friend of theirs could. And if they took it with them to a music festival or if a party happened at your house and everybody knew where the Narcan was, it could save a life. So it's only as good as we know where it is and how to use it. Um, that's, that's really important. If you're going somewhere to one of these sites to pick it up for free, it's okay to ask for more than one box if that's what you need. Maybe you need one for your teens um, in a space in the house where no questions are asked, right? They can grab it if they need it. And then maybe you need one for your work. But we 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 need to have, the dream is to have Narcan everywhere so that we all can um, save a life if we need to. And uh, yeah, I'm just really grateful to have had this time with all of you and thank you so much. And it's always a pleasure to present with you, Jen. We haven't done it in a while. So it's yeah, fun. I wanted to add one more thing is that there is, so if someone is using drugs by themselves, if you're not breathing yeah. and you've lost consciousness, then you can't give yourself Narcan. So there is a resource that we found a little while ago. Um, if you Google never use alone, maybe I'll, um, one of us, yeah, or maybe Max, you can Google that and get the resource. And it's an amazing service. It was actually highlighted um, on one of the wonderful. Um, oh, the NPR did a thing. Yeah, an NPR did a little story about it. So um, if you are using alone, you call and say hi. Um, 
you know, I'm about to use. And then the person on the other line list, you know, basically checks in and makes sure they're, they are okay. And actually the story highlighted the life that was saved um, by this very simple volunteer system that was set up. It was very, very touching story. Maybe yes. we can find that story and, and put that in the. Yeah, we could share that with um, yeah, the Nicoles. The Nicoles. Um, yeah, and I think the other thing that we want to just in line with that, Jen, I appreciate you sharing that, is if we have somebody in our life who is using pills and powders to just say with love and firmness, please don't use alone. If somebody overdoses, it's quick and you cannot Narcan yourself. So these these are choices you might choose to make. And I, I love and care about you. Please don't use alone. And uh, thank you all so much. Any other questions? Is there resources locally? I'm sure there are probably in the chat, but is there anything you can do regarding fentanyl testing kits or strips or how? Thank that you. That could be a thing as well. I know that's uh, come up in different places. And I think at music festivals, some of them have the kits and they're like a big Ziploc and several things in there. Could you please speak to that or about that? Yeah. Um, we do have several partners in our community that have fentanyl test strips. They are willing to donate some. Um, the Harm Reduction Coalition of Santa Cruz County, which is on our Narcan distribution um, list on the web page. We also have the Santa Cruz County Syringe Services Program where Rashawn Williams can provide some. Um, SaferX has a small pilot project where we have fentanyl test kit strips and Narcan in four bars in our county. Slow Brewing Collective, the Rush Inn, um, Moe's Alley, and the Jury Room have Narcan and fentanyl test kit strips. We hope, we hope to grow that program. They can be ordered on dancesafe.org. They can be ordered on Amazon, um, but there are a few places. And then I'm happy to report the Diversity Center is also going to have fentanyl test kit strips starting in November. Did that answer your question, Ben or Benjamin? And I, I think- Yeah, okay. it absolutely did. And I have one more, but I could wait. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. no, Talk. I just wanted to say that one of the issues with the test strips is that um, the fentanyl is, um, sometimes distributed in the in the drug, almost like chocolate chip chips in a chocolate chip cookie. So you don't always know whether what the, the part of the drug that you're testing actually has the fentanyl. But um, yeah, I think the best way to encourage to use slowly. Yeah, I think the Jen makes such a good point. So I could break a pill in half and test um, half the pill in water with the fentanyl test kit strip and it could be negative, but it's the other half of the pill that had fentanyl because it's not evenly distributed. So um, we, we encourage folks that if they are going to use fentanyl test kits, they really want to try to test the entire product um, and otherwise they may not know. So fentanyl test kit strips are another harm reduction tool, but Jen's right. They can give people a little bit of a false sense of security if they think, oh, I tested this little bit of my cocaine but the rest of the cocaine has fentanyl in it. So hopefully that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. So like if there's a box of pills, they test one pill, the other 50 of them could be Absolutely. potentially laced. Okay, thank you for clarifying that too, because that is an important point. My last yeah. question, thank you for asking, uh, letting me ask is, is there currently a local resource within Santa Cruz County that would specialize in presenting this information in Spanish? For example, if there's a parent night or, a local resource or even somewhere in a very dense, you know, Latino, Latinx community that could, um, that, that's like got staff on retainer or currently ready to go. Is there a local resource uh, for the Spanish speaking community with this information as well? And thank you all for doing this today, by the way. Well, this presentation was given in Spanish as well. Maybe you came later. There's a, a Spanish channel and an English channel. You maybe are in the English channel now. But I believe this was recorded in both channels, correct, Nicole's? Yes. So this is a resource for you, for the Spanish community. But we also, we were just uh, admiring this process that the Nicole's have set up with bilingual presentation. And we think we'd love to work with Jorge and Gisela again for this. Um, 
Ben, were you thinking, um, are there organizations or folks in our community that would present in person to like a monolingual Spanish speaking community? Was that, was that what yeah. I mean? Yeah, basically that and or lastly, as a result of that answer, I'm wondering like if I forwarded this video to people, will they have the option of hearing it in Spanish and English mm -hmm. just like it was recorded? Yeah. Yes. Um, okay, awesome. Thank you so very much. And, and just for you to know, friend, that everything on our website, you'll see like the Xylazine library is in Spanish on one side of the screen, it's in English on the other side. So we do have a lot of bilingual resources. And if you want to, um, I'll put my email in the chat. I would say that because we have um, another AmeriCorps Vista coming on, who's bilingual and bicultural and who will be on our team by December, that we might be able if you have some communities that you want to get in front of to educate, we might be able to partner and have some of our staff that are Spanish speaking participate. Did that land, Ben? Maybe we Yes, lost. yes, okay. absolutely. Thank you so much. And I, I was on the whole call. I just wanted to make sure. So thank you very, very much. Oh, wonderful. Thanks. Anyone else? I just so appreciate everyone asking questions and contributing. It's very heartening. And the comment from Silvia, como es importante de, de hablar con todo, toda la gente, no importa su edad. Any other questions or comments for Ali and Dr. Jen? Seeing lots of appreciation, you two. So thank you. Good. Well, before we let you go, we had a couple other things we wanted to let you know about. Let's see if I can get our slides back up briefly. And thanks to our interpreter and translators and the team for making this accessible as well. I'll turn it over to Nicole. Thank you. And I just also want to express appreciation for the presentation uh, today, Dr. Jen and Ali, and um, it, this is a great example of the kind of collaboration and shared learning that we try to offer and create space for in through the Core Institute. And so we have some more events coming up. We actually have another coffee chat, Core Coffee Chat, coming up on Tuesday that will feature uh, Maria Cadenas from Ventures, who's going to talk about Ventures' approach really transformational approaches to creating economic equity. So Maria will talk about the programs that they uh, have developed and offered like Semeitas, college savings accounts, the ALAS guaranteed income initiative. But really what she's gonna emphasize is how just even the design of those programs, uh, the way it's done you know, with community, uh, co you know, co-designed by community, that it's really required um, shifts internally in their organization, as well as the actual program design to really get at uh, addressing those root causes of economic inequities in order to create equity. So hope that you, if you're not already signed up for that, uh, consider registering and, and attending for that one. It should be really fascinating again. Uh, we do have a couple more events on the calendar and, and more that will be added to our core institute schedule in the coming weeks. And so um, Gisela will put the link to our core website where you can find the list of events uh, and find them as, as they get added. Um, and also, if you haven't heard or, if, again, if you haven't signed up yet, uh, we want to make sure everyone knows that the county of Santa Cruz and city of Santa Cruz are getting ready to plan and develop their next request for proposals funding process or RFP funding process. And they're starting by hosting um, six different, not six different, six community engagement sessions, same information presented and discussed in each session, but wanting to offer it multiple times to make it more accessible. Again, each of those sessions will be held bilingually like this. Uh, they'll be recorded, or at least uh, sections of it will be recorded and shared. But it's an opportunity for the service provider community, uh, for different partners, for really community members if they wanted to attend, to share their thoughts about um, how the county and city might want to think about using data to inform setting prior priorities, um, to help inform the county and city's thinking about um, how they make choices as they're designing the RFP with an equity lens, you know, thinking about 
do those choices increase equity or do they somehow reinforce or maintain inequities? So even if you don't plan on attend, on applying for core funding from the county and city, we actually encourage every anyone and everyone to attend because again, the more input and feedback that they hear, the better informed they'll be as they're making those decisions. Um, so again, Giselle is putting the link in the chat where you can find more information and the registration links. Nicole and I will be helping facilitate those sessions, um, but they are hosted by the by the county. And then last but not least, we would love your feedback about today's session. Um, it helps us learn what we can uh, always improve on, but also we love to hear what you thought of the content and presenters and love to share that with our collaborators who um, presented these Court Institute events for us. So please either scan the QR code or click on the link in the chat uh, to respond to the survey in English or Spanish. And uh, we very much appreciate your feedback. Thanks for being here today.